So this is just a quick little video uh, to say that I'm gonna get started on Tales of Greece, sorry, Tales of Troy and Greece by Andrew Lang. Ah, messed up the title. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is one of my started videos where I just talk about why a particular book attracted my attention, and then later once I've actually finished the thing, then I'll come back for a more thorough review. So, uh, having recently finished uh, Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman, which I reviewed in the video previous on this channel, uh, I was in the mood to continue, with, uh, to continue with something about myths or mythology. Uh, I'm living here in Vietnam where access to English books is limited, but the school that I teach at does have a small library, so I decided to browse along and see if there was anything that was related to legends or myths or something, because I, I was in that groove. Uh, I, I had finished this, I had enjoyed it, I wanted to continue with something similar. I, I actually looked to see if they had any other, in, sorry, to see if the library had any books on Norse mythology. Uh, because uh, I, having finished this one and, and found this quite interesting, I thought it would be interesting to see if there were any other interesting Norse mythology tales out there, or even if it was just the same tales, to see how they compared with a different author. But alas, the, the small library at my school did not have any books on Norse mythology, at least none that I found, none that were currently on the shelves. Um, but they did have a couple books on myth, uh, including this Tales of Troy and Greece. Now, Greek mythology, in contrast to Norse mythology, I already know. Uh, I, I read loads of Greek mythology as a youngster, as an adolescent. Uh, I, I know these stories backwards and forwards, most of them. Um, but... I thought I'd check it out anyways for, for a few different reasons. Um, one is because I, you know, I think the whole thing with Greek mythology uh, is that you're supposed to read it over and over again. Uh, I, you know, I once took a literature class uh, in which the professor said that uh, the, the ancient Greeks themselves already knew the endings to these stories before they uh, sat down to watch a play or before they started reading an epic. Uh, th these, these are all stories that everyone in the culture was familiar with, but the, they, they would uh, reread them again or they would read a different author's take on the old stories just for the pleasure of seeing how a different author would ta tackle those same stories or, you know, what emotions they could draw from a story that everybody was familiar with. So, so by that logic, uh, there, there's really no harm in going back and rereading uh, old Greek myths if it's by uh, an author you haven't read before or in a book you haven't read before. I, and, I, and I've not read this collection. Now this is, it's, it's labeled here as a classic. Wordsworth classics, even though this is not uh, the original ancient sources for these myths. This is by a guy named Andrew Lang, who I never heard of before, but I looked him up on Wikipedia. Uh, and he was a Scottish author who uh, lived about the turn of the century, the late 19th century, uh, some of his books in the early 20th century, uh, and uh, wrote a number of books on fairy tales and classic mythology. Uh, and so this is, even though this is, this is not one, you know, this is a secondary source. This is not one of the primary sources on the myths. Uh, I guess it's old enough that it's still being considered a classic. And uh, I always like, I, I don't know, I'm a bit of a snob that way. Uh, or not so much a snob, I guess, as a former literature studies major. Well, minor, actually. I was a history major, literature studies minor. But but still, the point holds. Uh, somebody who was just socialized into the idea that uh, life is a continual struggle to become well-read and to knock off the classics. And so this is uh, this is labeled as a classic. And uh, it's it was, it was originally a story for children. I mean, not young children, but I guess maybe adolescents. The, the, the age I was when I first really got into Greek myths. Um, but a classic nonetheless. I think, I forget exactly, I think this was originally published in 1910, if I'm remembering that from Wikipedia correctly. Uh, the introduction here uh, says uh, to H. Ryder Haygard, who was the author of King Solomon's Mines, uh, 
a book I've also previously reviewed on this channel, and apparently maybe a friend of Andrew Lang, uh, certainly a contemporary at least. Um, so just flipping through this, uh, it looks like this book is mostly on the Trojan War, seen through the eyes of Ulysses. Uh, so the, it's called Ulysses, the Sacker of Cities, and then the Meanderings of Ulysses. Oh, by the way, somewhat odd, uh, they refer to him as Ulysses, which is the Latin name, um, but just flipping through this, it looks like everything else is referred to by the Greek name. So I don't know just why that one thing is referred to, sorry, that one character is referred to as Ulysses, uh, especially because I would have thought this is one of those cases where the Greek name would have been better known, right? Uh, I, I think Odysseus is better, is more common than Ulysses. But maybe that wasn't the case uh, in, uh, in 19th century England. I don't know, you know, I'm just thinking out loud, but is that why James Joyce named his masterpiece Ulysses instead of Odysseus? Was, was Ulysses the more common term in uh, Victorian or Edwardian England? Uh, excuse me. And then after that, there's a uh, brief addendum on the Fleece of Gold, Theseus, and Perseus. Now, if you know you, your Greek mythology, you, you know that these, these other stories predate the Trojan War. So uh, it, it surprised me a little bit to see them placed after the Trojan War, but it looks like that that's because maybe those are just some extra stories that are kind of here as an afterthought to round out the collection or something like that. Looks, looks like the bulk of this is on the Trojan War. Uh, this is a slender little volume, as you can see, 256 pages. So I, I expect I should knock this out quite easily. Although it's difficult to make promises because I'm quite busy these days with working two jobs and a baby and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's something I'll maybe uh, nip away at at the, at the lunch breaks, slowly chip away at this at the lunch breaks and, and sh should finish this hopefully within a couple weeks because it's due back at the library on August 18. And I'm actually not sure what my school's policy on renewals are. So I, I'm gonna aim to finish it before then. Um, yeah, and if I do then, uh, there, there's a section here on the Golden Fleece, and I actually read a book earlier this year, which was also a retelling of the Golden Fleece by Robert Graves, so that will be the second retelling of the Golden Fleece that I read this year and review on this channel. Um, how's that for a, for a niche? Um, yeah, I don't have that much more to say about this because I haven't read it yet. Uh, I've gotten a page and a half in uh, and have been surprised by how readable and pleasant this is. I, I was almost expecting this to be, you know, a little bit stilted in the prose because uh, it, it's fr from a guy who was born in the 19th century and sometimes though, I don't know, my, my experience is that 19th century books are hit and miss. Some of them read surprisingly modern and some of them do not. Uh, but, but this looks like it's going to be quite readable. So, the, you know, the only, the only thing I'm uh, thinking might be an obstacle to enjoyment is just the fact that I already know all these stories. So, it could be a slog through a bunch of stories that I already know backwards and forwards anyways, or it could be uh, an enjoyable retelling of old, beloved stories. Uh, I, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. And uh, I'll come, once I finish this, I'll come back with a more thorough review and uh, explain how the reading experience was once I'm done with it.